Uh, good morning, everybody. How are you? Uh, so, uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, Christiana Care uh, in October 20, or excuse me, August 22nd. We just became uh, ISO 9001 certified. And if you all attended Chris Nowak's uh, presentation yesterday, you know, he, he explained a lot about the QMS and some of the FDA. Mike's going to touch on that. Mike is our quality manager. And he's really going to be the one that's going to talk about the majority of what we went through because he's the one that spearheaded a lot of them. Um, one of the things that uh, I just wanted to touch on before I, I turned over to Mike is, you know, we this took us a long time. And again, Mike's going to get in much more depth, but this took us a long time. One is going back to 2016, 20, you know, that time frame when FDA and Maya and all these folks were making their decisions and calling these groups together. Is uh, we were like. The writing on the wall is a QMS, and is what we had decided and thought we wanted to do was, do we need to get a formalized ISO, is Joint Commission, CMS, putting all that together, is that really, is it worth going down this path? So we decided we were going to investigate and look at this. It took us about two, two years before we finally said, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And then Mike took it, and it took us about six months to actually get the certification. And he's going to really talk about the detail, but um, it was it was worth it for us to to you know uh, go down this path so that we could at least go into this uh, educated and see, and then talk to you guys and say it was really worth it or not. I don't know of anybody else besides the DMVs that are uh, ISO certified in-house program. We are a pure in-house program. We are not serve, a remanufacturer or manufacturer. We are pure servicers. So um, we wanted to just see, is it worth it? What, what would it take? And uh, Mike's going to really get into that in much more depth. We're going to try to spark a lot of conversation. So if you have questions, please ask. Uh, Mike's going to kind of go through the, the differences between 13485 and 9001 and, and why we chose the path that we went. So, uh, I'll turn it over to Mike, our quality manager, Christine. Thanks, Blake. So, uh, why the hospital is the FDA request and the recommendation for the request from the FDA is that you're seriously in um, as we have us to try and formalize our QMS. So, that's not working. <coughs> It's not doing anything here. There we go. Yeah, we just ran it through it just to so tell you. Back in May, the FDA Safety, what can we do as an organization to try and improve that? And it 
was less time in our quality processes to make sure that they're as good as they can be. Let's do what we can for improving the safety that we have going on because that's going to help our safety. And that's no longer the wheels and not the wheels. There we go. So I touched on the commission. Um, if you were at Chris's speech yesterday, you heard a lot about 45 on the basic difference between risk and the definition of risk. For 9,001, risk is something that you have to evaluate, measure, and decide. And 1345, risk is much more defined with uh, equipment failure and patient harm. So, because the definition of risk is a little different, and 1345 is more geared towards manufacturing, uh, and then we'll pick our We've also got, I guess everybody has a CMS with deal below KPI. This allows us to put uh, appropriate quality measurements so up. You can keep an eye on the you know, repeat failures and things like that. So, certifying the ISO 9001 is a process where you have some audits. Have um, you come in with your processes where you double check yourself, make sure that everything that you say you're doing, you're doing. And as it turns out, maybe there's always a little screw. Um, <laughs> so that is what it was to have this certification passed, then your auditor should reach out to a international registered body, a certified organization. How do you get that person to come in and help you out with your audits? There's a lot of different models for ISO certification. Some are based on FDEs, some are based on budget, some are based on the number of locations where you have service. So we've had two hospitals where we really keep a eye on the shop. For us, a organization that said, hey, we're going to we're actually going to bill you and grade you based on you only have two main locations as opposed to the number of FTEs or annual budget or whatnot that allowed us to do some of to talk about. The second piece of that was how some help it work because I had a main question. You know, you got to have a main question about the fact that I got back to the question. So if I can pick up a phone and call someone, say, hey, can you come down for a, an audit? You come down and talk us through this next piece. Maybe we should do a video conference. How do we do these questions yesterday? Because I have no idea what you mean by work instructions. You know, my command, I don't have work instructions for everything that's out there. So, those kind of questions. When we had somebody who was available to answer your questions and say, well, when we talk about your processes for a different kind of organization, so, availability is important. Ease of communication, somebody who answer that. Who will answer an email. And not everybody who reached out to the certification was responsible. Community awareness. Healthcare is in a day with a lot of people. They want to focus on manufacturing and widgets. And trying to manufacture the health is, is something that's entirely important. So, make sure that those are listeners are made every time so they can't have that. Uh, cats for a while and once you did on a tree, but also familiar with the squiggly bills. And to help us take all of this, the we'll letter different books to be certified to and kind of put them into one quality management form. Everybody is over. So I sat through Chris's talk yesterday and I thought he had some terrific books. Everybody, everybody that was there was pretty nice. I thought that we were pretty worried about. And it's kind of a a couple of differences. So since we're using orange for Alan, I suppose all the orange for the shadow, I'm sure. But the things that he called out in 1345, I would say that some of the main differences are the unit identifier stuff. That's kind of unique to 1345 as far as documentation, the shareholder documentation. But the, the UBI requirement is just kind of particular. I will say though, most CMSs 
<clears throat> you have your uh, each asset has its own individual asset number, right? So you are segregating and identifying identifying based on, on those assets that go into that anyway, because we're required by CMS or CMS or the Joint Commission to have an inventory after an inventory of all of your equipment. So you were of course for meeting a lot of that without having to create a lot of extra um, uh, process in the 9,000 one because you're already doing. So you made that investment yesterday. Uh, that investment well is a whole lot of. There has to be a clear line, a clear line in the future. So can't just say, hey, let's go get certified and not have buy in for just responsible titles. So making sure that authorities hold the jurisdiction that makes title on the earth, but making sure that you're leaving. everybody's going to buy in. That doesn't just be funded. Yeah, well, I don't have a good It also means that you're willing to be your champion, speak up for you, and make sure that the rest of the people can support you and, and not just be a lot of people. So, a lot of leadership components I found between the two, four, five, and four, one. Very similar. So, leadership provides you resources, resources on you. But sometimes, just a little. Building has to be in good shape. And the air conditioning computers all on the line. Not really to have to be dry. And it's all over the building. Um, so there are a lot of things called out in most standards for environmental care. And we need a lot of environmental care stuff under the environmental care act. So without drilling down too far into it, one of the main differences was we um segregated this. I think I was mentioning yesterday, how do you know that your uh, infusion pumps are still broken or they're broken? Is there a no at all? Well, sure. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. We, we enjoy the enjoy putting work limitations on our present that are damaged and defective, but also all the parts. Again, to segregate good parts from bad parts, because what if you got a Control module has a little bit of knobs, and the knobs are like eight bucks a piece. And all the knobs are just little sets for it to go on and you got it and say, How do we Well, I can keep that in the hardest of the knobs off of it without having an actual functional control module. So, how do you do that without somehow the winding back up that they sent out the big chain? So, segregation is, is for us really important, not just on equipment, but also on the parts of the device that go with it for Some of the biggest differences between 1345 and 1001 are around manufacturing. I can say that the objectives were we did 9001. The biggest thing trying to do is get into some very good customers. The, the objectives for 1345 are more around quality manufacturing processes. Um, the way that we communicate with our customers and our regulators. So when we have a system, it is regulated, and we communicate with our customers formally through meetings and through feedback. However, I'm not pushing my certification for annual accreditation to the FDA or the FDA. Um, Establish planning corrective maintenance procedures. We have corrective planning maintenance procedures, but we don't sit down and say, to fix a widget, you must be more safe to see. There's other documents that are covered with that, and we cover those first. So, uh, with that, so, and if I can touch that on, is we do uh, our documentation is um, exception reporting. So if we go through and we do a PM on whatever device or, or, or we do a corrective maintenance, we, we document, we verify it's proper operation, we return it to service. Well, what is verifying its proper operation? We went through the manual, we went through the checkout procedure, we made sure that it was functional. That's what we did. We didn't go in and say, we check these, this one, you know, like a check sheet, check, 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 all the way down. We did all this. We're following, if, if, you know, we're verifying its proper operations towards what the manufacturer specs are. So it's exception reporting. If something was wrong, we did that. 13485, you need all those procedures. 
and all those check marks and everything for, for corrective as well as preventive. And that's a big deal if you think about that, having all of that on everything you work on. You know, we have 35,000 pieces in the back of the equipment, you know, 1,700 different types of equipment, you know, asset types. That's a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort. Is it really worth it? We're not manufacturing the stuff to put out. We're just servicing. That was a that was a big differentiator for us. Yeah. All right. So listen, I'm not cheating. Yeah. I was asked not that many questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, corrected. Uh, you don't do not have a step by step procedure of correcting. I, like, I don't have a you don't have a peer reviews step by step. We have a library of reference materials, and those cover step by step procedures. So I don't have to personally develop. We have vendors, we have vendors, the uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, manuals that we use as our reference material for if you're going to get into a manufacturing cases and your processes and your procedures, we rely on them. If they don't have anything adequate, those are the things that we have uh, created, modified, you know, little, little things, but it's not something that we check each time as we go through. Yes. So your policy guideline. Directives dictate that you will use the base factor literature to do all your procedures or for the procedures or any guys. That's that's in our that's stated in our manual in our quality manual. That's our order picture. Yes, we have to have that done. So that the depth of the ADM type of the distinguish is right. It's 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 a it's a simple sentence. Right. When 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 following when we're doing corrective or preventive, we follow when unless we're ADM. Right, right. If it's the ADM, then we specify what it is on the ADM. But if we're not ADM, we follow the, the manufacturer's guidelines for repair of ADMs. Simple, simple statement. Again, nothing on the device by that part. We cover that. Um, moving on to big differences. There's this management of our resume we didn't talk two different ways of defining risk. We took 45 and I was one. So risk management is a little bit different. Standards, it's not right or wrong, it's just different. That's actually a big piece that's preventing immediate adoption between the FDA and the EU. 1345 is the definition of risk. Staff process of reporting out the authorities, since we're not having a claim 1345, therefore we're allowed to sell the EU. We're not having to have that particular process, and that's a lot of the literature. In the 510K approval FDA and reporting in US, all of that following in the ICO and you know, creating going through that process and documenting it the way the manufacturers are required to do that is a big piece as well. Uh, we don't have to follow, we do document our course process and procedures when we're doing it, but we're not having to have a formalized process to report that back up to the vendor or to some other authority. If I have a problem, you know, yeah, do we do SMBA reports? Do we report? Do we draw that up? Of course, we do. just like anybody else, that's a CMS doing commission requirement, uh, as well as good practice. But it's the documentation process to establish that is pretty intense. And so we don't have to get to that level uh, when you're not talking versus 34. I guess I'll raise the big four work advice to the first, please, I read one of the things that I really do like is the data analysis that I tell the law enforcement to do. We did a lot of great things, a lot of, hey, I guess I've been working before, kind of analysis of previously, but this is a, a formal way of going back and checking for the details. And uh, DOA way parts come in, different things that allow us to go, wow. That's, that's a unique window to frame that data. Yeah, one of the one of the key things is is that we do is purchase it. We buy a lot of stuff, right? So that is actually one of our four key processes that nine thousand more wants to identify is purchase. We buy a lot of parts. So then, if purchasing is part of our process, well, what happens when I get a bad part? What happens when I have to ship that part back? How am I documenting? Am I documenting? How many times do you guys actually formally document and track why you had to send a part? Was it because you got the wrong part shipped to you? Was it because your tech 
technician ordered the wrong part was because the part was DOA. Are you tracking and monitoring it? That is a definite quality plus that we have started doing with the, the 9001 because that is one of our four key areas of focus. And it really does shed a light pretty quickly because every one that goes back, one part goes back for whatever reason, why? And also it has to have a shotgun or hit. You need to nine thousand points. Anybody's done marketing class and consider number squad test analysis. I swear I would never do one after marketing class. Wrote to the professor years later. Hey, almost I would never do one of these. I actually had to sit down and do a strength weight with this political environment, the stop local and start acting as the business. So how do you do this squad test analysis? Uh, work charts. I know organizations, but can I ever sit down right now? The work chart is a organization. Come up with a work chart. Uh, non conformance model. So, how are things non conformant? What does that mean? So, if I have a uh, non conforming part come in, if I have a non conforming system, I need to document something that's not working. So I have working that. These non components will also allow us to track those, those problems. A process failure. We realized that when we were doing this particular process, we were able to put up, and I'm just an example, we put a device back in the service that probably we shouldn't have. That's not the norm. We document, we track, and we squat. You know, three W's. Yes. For your mom, how do you guys distribute that across your amazing things that you're interested in? Do they see that from quality of the dashboard? Say that this is the trend. So we gave you a performance. How do you guys share that with your instrumental? I can do box of the team because I, we actually don't have a lot. This is the, that is called out that is something we have, but I have one. Today. And, and so to, to answer that as we move forward, um, the hospital is coming up with a process that we're going to utilize to our advantage every morning. We're going to have a huddle. You know, so, 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 so we have a huddle board. So, what was the problem? What went through? These are areas where we're going to have the technicians running that. What did you see that was non conforming? You know, that it could have been fixed, and then we can document and do that. To, to your point, how do we get that process? In our, we have a, uh, Mike's going to touch on more, we have quarterly management review that has to be done. And so we, for every Monday morning, we have a meeting with all of our leadership. And we go through, and we program up this quarterly into weekly chunks. So that every week we can do that, and that's where we go over this. So at least once a quarter, we are discussing what happened in all these non conforming all the different sections. But to that point, so we can get it, and that should make if we identify that as a trend, then we can come up with further actions that, that are required also. So, processes for applying for this intermediate, one of them is it's got uh, 10 features, but they never use one feature. Maybe it's a mixed layer accelerator, they never use 20 layers. So, do we need to replace uh, Mac Magnetron so that we can get more electrons out of it? It's a feature that never use. Maybe not. So, that's one of those books where we can talk with the leadership department and say, hey, you don't use this feature, do you want it? Maybe the answer is no. So, there's a process for approving them. I have to have to, but that is one of the things I know we want to be actually, hey, that could be handy down the road. To be able to buy towards effectiveness and cost effectiveness. 1345 would make it face it. Even though they don't use it, there's no need for it. You know, especially if you say the 20 electrons, well, they don't have a therapy that uses 20 electrons. Why do I need to and spend a hundred thousand dollars fixing something that's never been used? How would you document the to the user uh, that that function is not been? That is that that's part of your non-conforming piece that you then have to talk to the, the, the user and make sure that they accept and use that so that you can 
can say, are we, you know, the, the, the standard here? Are we, are we in, in agreement that we don't need to do this? And if they say yes, we document that effectively. We can do that right on. You know, basically, if you say, say, we know this is an issue, and they're going really to is the part of leadership. Yes, yes. And then we can help the leadership talk to their teams. Right. And again, focus on the team listening group. It really is the best system to go around around customer satisfaction. So our SCO, we had one week off, so we really touched on that. Um, we said that we have to work hard. We work hard so that we can do the right thing. So we can do preventative payments so that we can, and we also anticipate products to provide So those are our four. First order, correct the payment, put out the payment, or product payment. We aim for less than 1% of uh, our parts. Preventative payments went at zero between 12 and 30 days. We've got things that are not being uh, PM correctly, perfectly violent. Correct the payments so we don't have a rebate. Are we seeing devices that we have to reach out to? We've got Using KPIs and say that's the setup for that margin. Um, and then probably again, we'll move costs to delay the project. So there's some times where maybe a service elevator is an element of piece of equipment is now for the church. So we have to push the project and wait until the service elevator comes back. But that's not a our fault. That's a is there something that's going on there? We are the ones that are holding up the staff. I will be able to address it now. Currently, we haven't been up to the top of the staff. If I can mention one of the things, you can also use one of the key areas we said is ordering parts and purchasing. We can use outside information as our own. So, for instance, we are a part source pro customer. Okay? I'm not touting part source as, as, as a that is, I'm not saying go buy other for stuff, right? But I use there is it the primary source for all of our parts. Okay. So with that, if you they have a customer uh, action report, activity report, and in that customer activity report, it tells, oh, how many parts did I send back? What is my turnaround? What was my default? And, and so that's uh, information I don't have to generate. I can use for my nine thousand one because they're generating it for me because they're my primary supplier. And they are a qualified vendor. And we've gone and you have to go through that qualified vendor piece of mind, I'm sure to talk about. But that's a that's a big key component of something that I don't have to do that I can actually use for my own. We have two things in paper on my phone for Do I want to keep that binder on the shelf or do I actually have a folder on a shared time drive that anybody on our team? Anybody from the hospital like this can stop and look at what is your quality. And that allows us to be more visible. So if you're like on the paper report, it's just one time. Uh, I don't know. We went to how long does it take to do this? What's the recommendation? What's your estimates? I wear a lot of hats. One of the hats I wear is this one, but other hats are out there. So how much time do I have to do it? We did shoot us on the timeline. I think it's absolutely personal and general audiences because part of this quality management system is internal audiences. Let's try and be objective and look at what we're doing and then on a quarterly basis to make sure that we're trying to work. But let's make sure that we're looking off and up at ourselves and we're reflecting and making sure that we're continuously improving and we're having to be reference and to be looking on for the next three years you're kind of keep your heads in. Um, I'm, I'm going to touch on this. Mike has been told that not probably as much as he needs to. Or so, and because we've become 9,000 certified, our facilities engineering department has said, well, what does that look like for us? What if we went down this path? And I said, well, that's a really good process. And if you go through this, uh, by the way, you're required to have an audit form. Mike just went to auditing class and is now certified auditor, so he can do your auditing for you. You probably didn't know that as well as you probably know that. Those days of becoming for the requirements of the way you have to develop the quality. Processes and the 
deliverables. So, talking to the auditing organization, getting help setting up our quality management system, our manual, we had to map our current good processes into 9001. All right, well, we know that we have when you get in our parts, we know that we track our parts, we have a delivery, we recover that. We know that we do all of these things, but how do we then? How do we get it to one time? So that was a big piece of the that we all together. And then making sure that we had deliverables around those four big things, whether it was you know this European test or whether it was how many parts we sit back in the time. So coming up with those and then being able to track these KPIs. All right, all right, all right. But it's not as bad as you think. An internal audit, you get to stop and talk to everybody in the shop. You get to stop and go out and, and talk to people first, you know, down to the shipping receipt. And, and there's a lot of areas where I'm going to drink less much that, that being able to audit, you, you come to a better appreciation of, of how it's impactful our jobs are. It's kind of cool. So, Learning those audit skills, making sure that we've got this internally as well as bring someone from the outside and say, here you go, ask us a million questions. We've got documented processes that we offer to the group. Gosh, where did this think? So, having to segregate your inventory. If I've got two things on my desk, I know that it's sort of broken. Do I need to go through and label stuff while I'm in the middle of work? Well, maybe not. Maybe at the end of the day, though, you can make sure the workforce has to be stickers on that. So going to order stickers, you can still remember to get stickers. Mm -hmm. But order stickers so that you can segregate them to the suspected good from the bad parts. Um, harmonizing all of our policies, coming up with that index of records. It's easy to have a quality manual, but then to have a table of contents. What if you change the happy to flat on page 27? Do you have a document happy to change the flat on page 27? That's how you can do. That's an interesting task. And then teaching the language of quality management clients to the entire team. I think we had four different times that we had shop training on just what is this so that everybody understands the way that quality and safety at a hospital is good for a patient level. And the national imperative drives down to their work. The, the one thing I'll catch on is when, when you're talking about the language, it's not just the language, it's also the process. So we all have technicians that have Jones bond technicians, right? Where for quarters is people, as a, as a, as a industry, right? We, we might mention that board has got good knobs on oh, I might say that, I might be able to use those knobs somewhere. And they got it in the bench, they got it in the drawer, they got it in all the glass jar, all these little parts and all this other stuff, because they're good too. You gotta get them out of that. And you gotta, you can still do it, but you gotta label it and segregate it, and you gotta keep up with it constantly. Because he walks around, there's an auditor with his auditing hat on, and he comes up and goes, What is this? We don't say you're not. Yeah, right. But now we have to document it as a non performance, as a problem. And we have to go through, because it's true, it is a problem, because you can't let it get out of hand. It will, like that. But if it's labeled, good and spare, perfect, you're gold. You're gold. Or they have it in, they have it in a little bucket, it says good and spare, right? Whatever they do, they take off the knobs, they throw it in that bucket, you're good. We actually have uh, several storage areas throughout the hospital, and we ended up going, this whole storage area is good. Just, yeah, good, brand new stuff. This whole store, different room, different floor, even. This is stuff we think is good, might be, might not be. Was, we think it is, we got to test it before we put it back in the room. And then we have another area where it's, I know it's broke. Gosh, I know it's broke, we have to be fixed it, but can't, 10,000 dollars thing, you know, uh, let's, let's, let's keep it, but area. They're yeah, right. holding, we're holding it to trade in to get to the shell or whatever for something else, yeah. like no bad things. So we do segregate stuff a lot we have to get everybody going. Um, I don't know if the policy is decent, but qualified vendor 
as it turns out, we have 4,000 members. And I didn't know that we had 4,000 members. So coming up with a way that we can both grandfather and current members who have a problem at great. Each one of them would say, hey, if they stop showing the products, has that impact what we're ready to do? If uh, I have a general electric CCHD, just it's not a part of it, can I get somewhere else? The answer is yes. The baby is not the end of the world. The answer is no, but it's a kind of great association. Maybe it is the end of the world. Just stop them looking at all of my, all of my members and go, how important are they? What's the risk if they stop being my mentor? And then, is there anything that I can do in the processes now to find a backup, to improve my relationship with them, to make sure that we're managing that possible thing? So, one of the key things that Mike mentioned is the qualified vendor is I'm buying something from Intuitive Surgical, right? If they, if they stop selling, we're in trouble. <clears throat> so, my risk rating has to reflect that. If they stop, so I can't get it from our source. Right, I can't get it from you know Bob's garage down to my money because I can't order from him because he's not certified and this stuff. So I can't get it from him. So you know, we really you, you get really restricts you as you have to really make it. That takes a lot of time to go through four thousand vendors when you realize over the last several years, how many places have you actually bought a part from? It's Iowa. <laughs> it's Iowa. Yeah. Um, what about the parts thing? What about the people who made it? You guys consider pricing part of your risk for you guys in the parts of the program? Yes. That's part of your risk assessment for your vendors, right? You're going for them. And that's what I was going to do. So, we need to then start talking to the FDA services for the remanufacturing of parts, constituted services for the personal remanufacturing of personal components. All that, that's a can of worms that we go there as well. But that has that been done in your process yet? That's one of the beautiful work that I <laughs> That's a lot of leverage. So, yes, cost of the part is wrong. You can't put something that's going to make me a rain manufacturer into the system. But if Sony sells monitors to Striker, Striker turns around and sells monitors to me, and I just buy a monitor from Sony and it still says Sony, it's the same model monitor. Maybe I got a striker and I see the hospital was So, yes, you definitely have um, effective personal care policies that are cost effective. How do you determine whether a supplier is a um, 9001 certified? They'll tell you. They will not tell you. It's such a pain in the neck to do that they will shut up to the mouth. So, we've now got the that if you want to become a new vendor, I send you my form. So you fill out my form, I need model meter, that would be nice and everything else. But I need to know your you are all the system, I need to make sure that I need all the things about your organization before I can bring you in this as a person. Now, part of that is, uh, Chris kind of touched on it yesterday, <clears throat> is we have a qualified, we have a Another policy was internal to the the same name as called qualified vendors. And that is a little different. Is that one is for vendors that come in and rent these stuff. So when they come in, is if they, we have to go out and audit them personally and walk into the door and check and says, if I'm renting this ventilator from restaurants, right? Is we have gone out and they have validated. That they they check these devices and that their maintenance is up and everything is up. And I can get the records in 15 minutes if required, and they can tell me everything is in my hospital, out of my hospital, what the status is, all of that. And then they can bring the stuff in at 3 a.m. and I don't have to go out and check. Completely different process, but it falls kind of under this this rock. But it's not a 9001 process. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Verifying your documentation. Correct, correct. And they're they, 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 they going to react and they're going to relate, but they're not one and the same. How do you track, uh, speaking of rental stuff, how do you uh, track uh, like wound backs? So, wound backs are a different animal altogether. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the wound backs, we actually RTLS tag. And they come in, as they come in, actually, the 
our equipment room who manages the ins and outs of the the running backs because they are the vendor to get from the front of qualified vendors. And they they put an RTLS tag on them because our problem is they get bloody, the the environmental will wrap them in the red bag and they're out the trash. And that's seventy five thousand dollars out the trash that I have to pay for. So we we tag them and we track them that way. That is tracked within our RTLS system because it comes and goes so fast. Yeah. yeah. And so that is actually ins and outs of track there internally. But because we're one of my qualified vendors, I get a moment's notice. I can call them up and say, How many do I have in there? Who would be KCI? Uh, I don't think it's KCI. I think it sounds I know we do KCI or something, but I don't think we do all the balloon facts. I'm sorry? Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I have a people. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't. You're not quite sure. It is, yes. And actually, the Mike can't do that. Mike does it on a quarterly basis. The, the, the auditing, our auditor has to come in on an annual basis to go through that, to do that for us, to make sure that we are doing what we say. Dustin, you got a question? Uh, to what level? Uh, Granularity do you associate your parts with the repair, such as a serialized part or a non serialized part? So, going back to your knob example, let's say those knobs look fine, but then they wind up being uh, a source for concern because there may be a recall several years later. And you know, how do you track where you got your parts from and where they went? So, new parts are easy because it's in the same amount. We, we're tracking that. We're able to between us and the part source process that we're tracking that and, and it goes to the asset to which it went to. That's easy. The used parts, that's that's a that's that's a whole other animal and we built to be quite honest. We built. Um the used parts. Yeah, that's the risk of the That uh maybe a bad analysis, but almost as bad as okay. Change the value. Change the value. If I'm taking some off the original device, and then there's a recall that comes out, I'm going to probably end up checking those anyway. But I can't just run all the devices. This is the question. In your process of all right, then how many of those vendors are there? Four thousand. And some of the two have already been responsible. So I have enough. And enough in my own vendor's lesson. So I learned I work with Amazon. We have a key person in my suit. So from Amazon. How do I order Amazon and know the fly hires in the hospital? So some of them I had a grandfather in and stop and consider what is the risk that I take on from that organization? Am I really worried about the wise people that are right? So it's a selective process that you call it? I am not personally aware on what risk I think that it's acceptable and review that as a presentation. So when you go into and your, your first initial step into 9001, I would assume 13485 is if I'm using vendors and I've used it in the past and I had no good stuff, I can grandfather them into my process. Okay. And I can, I can grandfather them in and say, Okay, I can just now. I know that I'm buying from Moss Garage. I'm probably not going to buy from him anymore, even though know, he's still in my vendor list. But uh, as I move forward and I get new vendors, then it's a much more stringent process to take each one. Yeah. 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 I have these really great ideas sometimes. You know, so, oh, wait a minute, all those other things on fire, put on fire. Is that a great idea? And, and all of those great ideas that wind up on the back of our process improvement for better relationships for, for all of them, they don't stay on the back of our Because if you say, I have a great idea, and write down, well, then you're going to come back to this. And you can revisit it until you put that great idea in front. So, all the four men that are used for me have been incredibly good for just 
giant college that was a, this this hot topic that was great on Monday by Friday. I'm not worried about something the whole lot being the way for that so Those things don't be lost. So I'm finding a lot of value in and so on Monday morning, I promise you that that's when we do our thing. And we've gone through these classes, we're gonna have some good ideas that we've learned from you guys. But it's like now we need to put them in place at the top and then the track. Either we're gonna break it to fruition or we're gonna get to a point and say maybe it wasn't such a good idea, it's not gonna fit into it, but you can at least not give them that path. But that is that really is a benefit, something that we've done. But did we really formalize it? Did we put a bow around it? Now we are. That's a benefit. We have a saving mess for we have the ability to, to talk to other organizations and say how many um, infusion pumps do you have and what's their failure? We we can keep all this data out there, but to take data and then make it actionable. What do you do with that? You make something that can say, well, having all the management system allows us to review all that data and then take step forward to one of the data. Thank you. 